schools are deep cultures, but the stories that they tell, the narrative that drives them are pretty essential. So uh, not knowing much about it when we first came, but then finding out everything, not just about the story itself, but so much more about the school, about its founder, about the founding family, and about all the people that have gathered to make the school work. That's what's in this narrative. The pageant has really been a tradition uh, around the holidays for our, uh, the Shriner family for as long as I can remember. Um, it, it's part of getting ready for uh, Christmas coming. And it's just been something that we've taken for granted, if you will, and participated in and watched for our entire lives. Um, uh, obviously, my dad was, was so involved with, with making it happen every year, but we were involved as, as watchers on the side, and um, it has meant so much to us for, for so many years. I remember as a little girl, um, we would always come here on um, the Friday evening, and we would walk up, make our way up the hill to the chapel, and the luminaries were just aglow. It was just so pretty. And I would walk into this beautiful building and would just be in awe. It's a must-see for me when Christmas season comes around. Um, so it, it's, it's never Christmas in, until I see the pageant. For 95 years, the sound of chimes ringing through Church Farm School's Chapel of the Atonement has accompanied Little Brother's humble gift of a coin for the Christ child as part of the annual Christmas pageant. Preceded by an array of characters, knights, artists, kings, queens, and misers among them, who believe abundance will cause the church's long silent chimes to ring, it is instead Little Brother's altruistic present on behalf of his older sibling Pedro that most represents the spirit of the season. In 1924, Church Farm School's founder, the Reverend Charles Wesley Schreiner, adapted Raymond McDonald Alden's popular 1909 story, Why the Chimes Rang, for the school's own Christmas pageant. Pageant, as it is simply known, is performed as a pantomime with students adorned in period dress as both male and female characters. The headmaster serves as narrator, with faculty and staff toiling for months behind the scenes as directors, set decorators, costumers, organists, and choir conductors. As the assistant to the head, Ned Sherrill, I help to coordinate uh, the pageant, uh, working with the many departments that help to create the magic of pageant. The development office, uh, the art department, the faculty, the students, the facilities crew. Um, it's a wonderful collaboration. The whole community was involved in the pageant at the school at that particular point in time. So the pageant, the, uh, the chapel had to be prepared. Of course, the costuming had to happen, the makeup, the rehearsals, the practice. And, you know, it just was another thing that brought us together. Guests to pageant, many who have attended for generations with their families, play the part of a church congregation, participating in the recitation of prayers and the singing of hymns and holiday music. A local highlight of the Christmas season, pageant draws hundreds of friends, alumni, and current and former faculty each year for its December weekend run. I would say I've been coming to the pageant for 60 years at least. Um, obviously not every single year, but I first attended the pageant as a young child with my family. It was part of our Christmas tradition. There's never been a time when it doesn't move me emotionally, um, and it's, it's often the music that will, that will do that for me. But the story resonates for a lot of people. One of the beautiful things about coming back to work at Church Farm as the Director of Admissions uh, was raising my family on campus. Uh, we came to Church Farm with a, a three-year-old girl and very shortly thereafter uh, she was followed by a little brother uh, and to raise them on campus was, was just beautiful and special. It was such a wonderful community uh, and the pageant was a big part of that. It was the beginning of the Christmas season for our kids uh, and seeing the wonder uh, of that event and the pageantry, no pun intended, uh, reflected in their eyes reminded me of the wonder uh, that I experienced as a student. In fact, I talked to our four grown kids to um, make sure that I was recounting their memories as well as mine. So, um, and they all remember that being like, that was when Christmas really happened. 
you know, when they came, came to that. Um, it was just part of our family tradition. They loved that it was a tradition at the school. And even as they grew and went to college and came back, that made them feel like they were really home. You know, that, that was sort of normal and stayed the same even though their lives were changing. By design, little has changed about the presentation of pageant over the decades. In its heyday, pageant was performed up to five times during the course of the weekend and was standing room only before the chapel was expanded in the 1960s. It is said that for the afternoon performances, the procession would mirror the book's narrative with the cast and the guests trekking in costume from Greystock to the Chapel of the Atonement, looking like lines of ants, all moving in the same direction. You know, in the early days, uh, they, they actually played the backstory where the old woman in the snow was discovered by the two boys and then uh, the uh, younger boy was sent ahead to the cathedral while the older boy took care of the, the sick old woman. So that was actually per, put on, I think, somewhere down in Greystock Hall and then everybody trooped up for the rest of it. Longtime attendees arrive as much as two hours early to vie for the best seats in the chapel, where they have the most unobstructed view of each character's procession to the altar. During the evening performance, luminaries line the cobblestone walkway to the school's historic Chapel of the Atonement, fashioned with care to represent the great cathedral hosting its Christmas festival. When uh, Joe Ryle uh, left the school and retired, he was doing the luminaries, and I, so I, I started setting up luminaries with him and then um, took it over for a while, for the last 10, 15 years. I think the luminaries are you know, what brings the public in and what brings everybody in. Um, it's just, it lights the way, the pathway to get there, and it really brings the theme of the story into it as well. The feel of the pageant is amplified when you walk in those big, thick arched doors. You know, you walk up the center lane. Sometimes we have luminaries set up out there, depending on the weather. Uh, you smell the candles, you know, you walk in, you see the garland hanging from all the lights, and, you know, the narration from the pulpit is is awesome. Pipe organs, are, you know, usually greet you on your way in, and uh, the boys put on a heck of a show. When this room, this building, is decorated with all the greens and the ceilings and the candlelight, and then when the music comes on, it is, it is as new and fresh every year that we come to see it as it was the very first year when we, when we came. Um, it, it just, it takes us over and fills us up with a kind of awe that is only during pageant. Pageant begins with the uninterrupted recitation of the book through the trials of Pedro and his little brother, two boys traversing through the winter weather to see the Christmas festival for the first time. When they stumble upon an old, poor woman stuck in a drift of snow, Pedro hands little brother his only coin, urging him to present the gift at the altar for the baby Jesus and reminding him to see and hear everything twice, once for you and once for me. I always felt the two little boys, Pedro and little brother, were orphans because it never mentioned mother, father, they came from a family. Why would they be out there on the road in the middle of nowhere? There was a real parallel and I wonder if the Colonel picked that up and said, orphans reaching out to help other people. The two little boys that are in the story are kind of on their own, and they choose to go out into the world, do something special that will have meaning for them. Um, and they have a little adventure that they didn't expect, but they make the most of it. Um, the older boy makes the sacrifice of just sending his little brother to go without him. You can tell that he really wants to do it too. And I think a lot of our boys come um, ready for an adventure of a kind, but they're ready to go and see what's out in the world a little farther than they've had before. Schreiner chose why the chimes rang with deep intention. Its message is one that closely aligns with Church Farm School's own mission. This deeply moving tale of humility and charity is a fitting annual tribute to the Christian teachings of the school and to the many friends who have given gifts, large and small, that have advanced Church Farm School's humble mission 
to make a difference in the lives of its students. The story itself is simple, it's basic. Um, like the little engine that could, I think I can, I think I can, I thought I could, I thought I could. Um, just a little brother coming down the aisle. But its simplicity cuts to the quick in pretty uh, profound ways. I think my grandfather probably might have selected Why the Chimes Rang uh, to, to be the school's pageant because of the messages that are inherent uh, within the story. Uh, the messages of, of sacrifice and, and giving uh, in pursuit of the greater good uh, for the greater good was probably something that was really important to my grandfather and something that he understood himself uh, through many of the decisions and choices that he made in his own life. The underlying theme, uh, every aspect that you can pull out of the pageant ties directly to the mission of Church Farm School. When you give, there's a way to give, and giving really is a, an intimate, personal, spiritual thing, and it's done out of humility and out of faith. And Church Farm School really pulls that out of people, whether they realize it's happening or not. I feel like Why the Chimes Ring is a perfect story for CFS is because it really gets the idea of humility and self-sacrifice in that even though you don't have like the most expensive gift or you don't have everything else that everyone else has, you can still achieve more, like the same or more than others. And that really goes back to the idea of CFS giving back to students who really need it, who have like a lot of, who have a lot of potential. As a pantomime, much of the pageant's dramatic atmosphere comes from the music provided by the pageant choir and the organist. Traditionally, the middle school choir sang at pageant, but since the middle school closed in 2015, participants have been called from the larger student body who sing four defining works, O Come All Ye Faithful, Away in a Manger, and Silent Night, along with the triumphant final piece, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. The songs that we sing for pageant choir, they're all in the hymnal. Um, and they're very popular Christmas songs, so Silent Night is always the song they probably know the best, uh, and, and they're good with that. But there's a few other songs that I think they know from being in pageant, uh, and a few of them they have to memorize the, the lyrics because the lights are out when they sing. So uh, that is something we actually have to work on a lot, um, but they, they really do seem to love singing the songs. You come for the Christmas carols. Uh, the way the organist plays them, uh, it just, it's so inspiring. When the boys walk in and walk up through, I always say, slow down a little bit so I can hear more of the carols. The chapel's 33 rank 1962 Aeolian Moeller organ is key to the presentation of pageant. Besides accompanying the church's singing, each character has particular music for their procession, indicative of their personality. For example, when the strains of Good King Wenceslas begin to play, longtime attendees rejoice at the arrival of one of the pageant's most beloved characters, the knight. The music evolved significantly through the decades, thanks to a group of talented and dedicated organists who have worked at Church Farm School. I think it was Charlie, uh, who was assistant master, headmaster back then, gave me a booklet with music that had been used in previous pageants, and he, he gave me the idea that this was not, not something to just be treated lightly. This was very important stuff. The seriousness that the masters and the students uh, took over the whole thing was just incredible. And the work that went into the, the costumes and all of that, I think it deserved a lot more than the music that was in this binder that Charlie had given me. I talked with, the, with Dr. Schreiner on how we could improve some of that. And he was very stern with me, but he always had this little twinkle in his eye so that I, I knew he was listening to me, but yet I never told him that. But he, he, he thought that would be a good idea. Well, see what you can do, Will. And, uh, and yes, I made some improvements, I think. 
When I first came, I was told to not change anything. I mean, there was an expectation of how the whole thing was to play out, but there, were no, there was no musician here to tell me how to do that. I was really figuring it out on my own with guidance from Jim Hur at the time and Terry, um, who were saying, you know, faster, slower, this is too loud. The music itself isn't hard. I mean, it's just basically Christmas carols or arrangements of them. What was difficult was um, knowing how long you had to play or figuring out the whole system of when a character would come down, when the music starts, when do you start the next piece, what are the cues for all of those things. And then the timing, because each of the characters has a little bit of their own thing and making sure that it made musical sense at the same time. I think the music that is played and sung um, is the most vital part of pageant, especially because the characters uh, don't, they don't have any speaking lines, and although it is narrated, um, the way that the organ switches um, to emulate different instruments and um, the different songs that are chosen mimic each character so well, um, and I think without that, you wouldn't really understand the characters as well as we do. And of course, music has the most important role in pageant, making the magic happen. When you hear the chapel door slam and little brother makes his way up the aisle and the awe in his face and in his eyes looking around at this beautiful chapel, it's just incredible. And then for him to go and um, tug on the priest's uh, robe, the lights go out, the chimes ring, and there's just nothing like it. It just gives me goosebumps. I try not to play the chimes in rehearsal until the dress rehearsal or the one just before that. And that really came out of when I came here, uh, Jim Hur, was, who was directing it, I would be ready to play the chimes in rehearsal and he'd come over and put his hand right in front of the organ and said, wait, 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 we'll, we'll do that and save it for the drama closer to the performance. I remember hearing it for the very first time and like, it was kind of surprising because I mean, I didn't really know what chimes were to begin with. So then like, I was always like, cause like you're doing the rehearsal and you're like, yeah, just look up and like see if the chimes ring. And you look up and you're like, okay. So like, are they ever gonna ring? Like, are they ever not going to? And then when they ring, it's like, like that's actually, a, it's a pretty nice sound. Like you, it's something that I'm pretty sure everybody would like to hear like over and over again. There have been many pageant directors through the years. The school's founder originally performed double duty as director and narrator. Other directors have included guidance counselor Howard Wright, Mrs. Combs, second headmaster Dr. Charles Schreiner, history chair James Herr, woodshop teacher John Seishan, and arts chair Dina Schmidt. Being asked to direct one of the school's most beloved traditions is a high honor indeed, an honor that doesn't come without angst at trying to wrangle dozens of young men with Christmas break in their sights. I started to work at the school in 1996, I believe, as uh, the woodshop teacher. And a couple of years after that, I, I got involved with the pageant by helping Bob Davini, who was at that time the uh, prompter in the back. And then uh, when uh, Jim Hur retired a couple years after that, I became pageant director. And uh, I've been doing the pageant as director for probably 17 to 18 years. Pageant is my way to give back to the school. Um, and uh, it, it, it just means a lot to me uh, to be able to direct it for as long as I have and uh, to, see, uh, to see the people come in and they really enjoy it and, and to see them really get into it uh, yeah, with the singing and, and everything. Uh, so uh, yeah, it is. It's very special to my family and, my, and myself. At first when we start with pageant, the kids come in, they have a lot of energy, they're kind of giddy, they're kind of goofy, um, but then something happens. Once they start to put on the costumes and they start to use the props and they start to see the um, heaviness of it and the, the depth of it, they become transformed. The director's first step is casting. And this is often done in conjunction with the headmaster who handpicks actors for the critical roles of Little Brother and the priest. To me, I feel as though the Little Brother envisions kind of like a very pure and honest look on giving yourself to God. Because once the little brother gave the coin, that's all he had. He bet everything on his love for God. A love that he shared with his older brother that was no longer there to support him. The priest is always uh, 
uh, one that I look for. Uh, it's normally one of the, the top end students in the class, I guess, get that, that uh, position. Second time I played in the pageant was 2012, my senior year as the priest. The priest was definitely um, a great position for me as I was a student leader at the school and it was just an enjoyable uh, opportunity um, to be on stage and to be the guy to accept the gifts and, and help the chimes ring. The director typically has only a few short weeks to get students acclimated to their characters. While no lines must be memorized, mannerisms, pacing, and timing are critical, as they must match the narration and the music. The sweet young girl must sniff her bouquet when prompted, the priest leaves the altar to assist the decrepit author, the miser leers at the congregation, wary that they will steal his sack of money and internally struggling to hand over his bounty to the priest. The nuances of each character and each actor's unique portrayal of those nuances make the pageant wholly unique and delightful each year. The pageant has no words other than the narrator, but everybody involved in the pageant has no words, which a lot of people would look at and think, wow, that must be easy, that's simple. Whereas I look at it and think, wow, that's a challenge. So I was one of the Norsemen, basically kind of like a Peter Pan kind of look almost. Uh, but, um, and I did that for two years. The instruction that went into being one of the Norsemen, we had to come out and I had to smack the maps into the hands of the other Norsemen. It was that action that was so important and so much detail that went into making sure that we did that as part of our role and our high steps that we had to take as we were coming down the, uh, the aisle of the chapel. Um, just so much of it was uh, so much detail that people just don't know that went into it. For the Young Shepherd, when I was doing it, um, I, I remember Mr. Seashawn just kind of telling me just like, just like act like you're just a kid again. And like with the Shepherd, just try and make it look as realistic as possible. And then as for the Old Shepherd, um, my dad always used to tell me that like, I look like old man, like you walk like old man. So I kind of just like got into that character of like, a, I'm just like old man, like I'm trying to be like my dad, even though he's not that old. So I was trying to be as old as I could possibly be. Definitely Little Brother was always a fan favorite, but um, in terms of people and um, to see who was gonna be the cutest and the littlest and you know, um, all of that. But then unanimously, we all looked forward to seeing how the miser played out and how scary he was. <laughs> and, um, as well as the night was a big favorite. I think my favorite part of the pageant is how each character turns when they are at the altar to look to see if the chimes are gonna ring. And part of you wonders if those chimes are gonna ring for the miser or the vain girl or the king and queen. The most coveted role remains the king what young man doesn't want to portray royalty and stride down the chapel bedecked with a robe, crown, staff, and a full court alongside him? Pageant always has this legacy of, um, I guess, a continuity throughout the entire school history, which was really good. Um, he was the king in his senior year, too, so that was... That was that was nice. It was nice. I didn't. I never wanted him to feel that he had to follow in my footsteps, but it was nice to see that I could pass the uh, pass the royalty down to him in a sense. So it was, it was, it was good. But no, I, I didn't give him any tips. I I think he was a far better king than I was anyway. <laughs> so I wouldn't have been one one to give him any tips. He's probably the shortest shortest king in the, the history of the school. Of course, an annual thrill, especially by the students is seeing their peers portraying the myriad female characters, including the vain girl twirling her pearls, the queen, and the sweet young girl who delicately clutches a beautiful bouquet of lilies. I was all of 5'2 with no peach fuzz on my face. Um, I was co coerced into it. I sort of volunteered for it. They came and talked to me, but it was because I looked like I was 12 years old and nice and sweet. <laughs> it's always funny and refreshing to see how much they and their peers appreciate their transformation once they're complete with 
um, makeup and hair. And you know, that speaks a lot to the vulnerability that the boys have with participating in pageant, wearing the costumes and engaging this activity. Pulling the pageant together visually are the costumes, props, makeup, and festive decor. Mary Woodside Herr, wife of the late Jim Herr, who directed the pageant for many years, served a pivotal role in pageant, setting the story into a definitive time period. Once that was completed, she dedicated endless hours ensuring that the most high quality costumes were acquired and maintained. Things really changed when Jim Herr came to school a colleague and a good friend of mine in the history department because he took over. And his wife, Mary Herr, was a mass, mistress, mistress seamstress. She was wonderful. She, had, she taught weaving courses at Westchester University and she got totally involved in this to the point where she went back into medieval pattern books and created these costumes from scratch, made them all herself. And it brought real authenticity, real medieval authenticity to the pageant. I married Jim Herr in the spring, and then winter came and he became involved in the pageant, and I came to see it on a Sunday, which is, was a night service at that time. And I was looking at the characters that they came up the aisle, and I had been looking for something to do for the school. And up the aisle came the farmer holding the, pa the plate of grapes. And I, it was like he was handing me a gift. So finally I could do something for the school that was just perfect for me. My big contribution was picking a period. Uh, Medieval seemed the best because you could dress boys as females and it wouldn't be too blatant, it wouldn't be hard. And the, because the main thing is for them to enjoy it. The history of the costumes and the props goes way back to the beginning. Uh, the costume that the miser wears used to be uh, a church vestment for Charles Schreiner, the elder, the founder of the school. And it's tattered and worn, patched and re -sewn. Mary is also a fount of knowledge about the props, many of which are antiques or repurposed items that have been maintained with care through the years. Many a pageant actor or crew member will relay that a major prop change over the years was the introduction of plastic grapes to remove the temptation of fresh grapes. My favorite role, I think, was the husbandman uh, because you got to carry a really giant uh, platter of fresh grapes. One standard funny memory that you're gonna hear from lots of people is that as the husbandman, one of your most important duties was to protect the grapes. Um, they were in the prop room, you were one of the last characters out, um, and if dinner had been bad on that Friday night or that Saturday night, uh, those grapes went pretty fast. When the two servants come down, they're lugging that, that heavy box. Uh, I have no idea, but I fixed that several times. Uh, you know, it's old and it keeps coming apart. And uh, I used to go over all those props before the pageant and I would bring them down to the shop and make sure that they were in good order. The sword, the same way. I would polish that sword up, you know, and try to get all the, the pit marks and the rust out of it. Um, the trumpets. Oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many coats of paint they have on them. <laughs> how many times I had to straighten them out. Makeup and beards truly transform each student into their character. And like everything else, the processes have evolved with the times and the availability of better products. I came here in 1965. I was hired to run the English department. And I immediately met Paul Anders, who was teaching in the lower school. That's when we had fifth and sixth graders and he was the head of pageant in those days. And he immediately said, we need somebody to do beards to make the men look realistic. So I took the gauntlet. And in those days, the beard hair came in braids. So we'd buy a quantity of red, white for the old shepherd, gray for the author, a couple brown tones, 
yellow in case we had anybody who was going to look like a, a blonde Nordic type, and black. And then you got these braids into the classroom and realized they have to be combed out. They have to be matted so that you can cut parts of them to fit into a beard. So as soon as December came, there was electricity at Church Farm School because so many things were going to happen. There was going to be pageant. There was going to be Christmas. The kids were going to go home. So everybody was involved. I always helped with the makeup. The very first time I helped was when Mary Carlson was in charge, and it would have been the first year that we were here. Um, we came out from Michigan to be here, and we uh, had our two little children. Uh, they were two and three years old, and we looked to be part of the life of the school. Doing makeup for the pageant is really important as far as understanding the different needs for each character, not only because of their costumes, but also understanding what makeup to use for their skin tone, also color palettes that match their costume, and understanding the different makeup needs for lighting during evening performances versus day performances. Costumes, props, makeup, and decor all coalesce at the dress rehearsal where the students are fully able to embody their characters as they will be throughout the weekend's performances. The costume and makeup itself is really what makes the performance because when you get into costume and everyone else is in costume with you, you really feel like you're that character and the makeup really adds to that. And the thing that I feel really gets you to know that you're that character is when you're walking down that aisle and you hear the music playing, you really feel like you're the character that you're playing. So after the performance, the kids are excited. It's more of a relief that they, they've done it, they've performed it, it's behind them. Um, but at the same time, they're also now have become that character. So now they have that in their history. That is part of who they are now, part of their church farm school experience. Since 1924, Why the Chimes Rang has served two essential purposes. It is an invitation to revisit and live more deeply into the Christmas season and it conveys the reality that goodness often starts with a humble, selfless purpose, an act of love upon which the school itself is founded. It lays bare in resplendent fashion the idea that the greatest and the best offering is the one given most sincerely, unreservedly, and generously. It is a universal story. It is Church Farm School's story. Telling things about themselves or a deeper sense of themselves and their faith. I think it, it takes a while for us to discover who we really are. And adolescence is just that awakening of the world and of the depth of oneself. And so I think little seeds are planted by the narrative. And when alums come back, it's clear that the seeds have taken hold. They've borne some fruit. They recognize in the school uh, much more so than just the pageant, but the pageant being central to that, to that experience. A sense of really sort of where they are, where they need to go, how they can make a contribution. You don't have to be rich and famous. You just have to be present. You have to be whole. Uh, little brother is that in his own innocence, uh, putting that together. So I think it continues to leave a legacy of hope, uh, of commitment, of blessing, of no matter what the world throws at us, things come around right when good people are involved doing good things. Why the Times Rang celebrates inherent goodness and character in people. It shows that these traits are more important than worldly riches, and in the end, they triumph. The story is Church Farm School in so many ways to help somebody that, who doesn't have the opportunities that uh, a lot of boys have and um, gives them an opportunity to open up doors and, and lead their life into a, something they dreamed about. The story of the, why the chimes ring relates to the mission of the Church Farm School um, because having different characters from different parts of the land of where they were coming from um, bring their gift uh, it was something that church farm does for students like myself coming from philadelphia 
uh, students coming from South Korea, um, students from Italy, all over the world came and brought their own personal gifts. And that was something that really resonated with me um, while I was here, knowing that everyone had their own individual uh, special gifts to bring to the table, and the chimes always rang at the Church Farm School. I think it's special because it was special to the Colonel. And I think, without knowing his mind, I think he felt as though that's what his calling in life was to be the little brother that would make the chimes, <laughs> that would make the chimes ring. Because the older brother gave up his opportunity to take care of an old woman. That's why. And they gave everything they had. That's why the chimes ring.